Well, good day, guys. Welcome to Life in the Peloton. I'm Mitch Stocker, your host, and the podcast is being made possible by our partners, Map. Map was born in Melbourne, a city with an unhealthy obsession with sport, style, and coffee. Map have expanded all over the world, but always make sure they have one cleat clipped in to their hometown, Melbourne. Well, here we go. Enduro. What the hell am I talking about? It's a mountain bike event, but enduro, what does that mean? Well, since retiring, I think you know I've been changing the narrative a little bit by pushing myself outside my comfort zone to try and explore all the Pelotons out there and understand all these different cycling cultures. Look, but on a personal note, I bloody love it. I love feeling like a kid again, starting a brand new sport, learning new skills and trying to get better and better. The progression is so fast and when you start right at the bottom. Well, this is exactly what I'm doing here. Last year, as you may know, I was lucky enough to experience the cream of the crop in cross-country mountain bike racing, the Cape Epic. Despite completing one of the biggest mountain bike races on the planet, I still felt like there was much more to explore in the world of flat handlebars, you know, these chunky tires, suspension, and all that stuff. Enduro seems like the perfect next step on my mountain bike journey, you could say. There's some pedaling, sure, but it's all about technique, skill, and you've got to have balls. On the horizon, there was this new event called the New Zealand Mountain Bike Rally based out of the New Zealand Mountain Bike Trail Mecca, Nelson. Okay, look, I've ridden a bit of cross-country mountain bike, but going downhill is so different. Blue runs, black runs, double blacks, gap jumps, rock shoots, Jesus. What was I thinking when I'm getting into this? So a couple weeks out, I got the bike. A big bike, as they call it. A stump jumper from Specialized. Okay, that's half the job, I guess. But then I met up with a mate who I've been seeing quite a lot recently who knows how to go downhill pretty well, you could say. Paul Vanderplug to give me a fast track on how to ride downhill. Back in 2013, Paul was crowned the world champion in cross-country eliminator. But it's not that he just has the creds. He knows how to teach a nomad like me. Once I got over to New Zealand, I was lucky enough to be able to spend some time with a young gun in the enduro world, Matt Fairbrother. Matt was on the eve of starting a crazy adventure himself, but he still found the time to take me out the days before the rally and session some tracks, features, and run me through the whole details of the sport itself. Look, something I did pack with me when I was over in New Zealand was Pillars Triple Magnesium. This stuff is ridiculous. I'm sleeping better, deeper, and I'm waking up that much more rested when I have Pillars Triple Magnesium 30 minutes before bed. It's outrageous. This stuff really does work, guys. Pillar is a sports micronutrition company started here in Australia, developing products that intersect between pharmaceutical intervention and sports supplements for athletes. It's not only about sleep, though. Pillar's Triple Magnesium features three selective forms of bioavailable magnesium. These specific forms provide multi-action support for neuromuscular function and aid the recovery phase after physical activity, including aches and pains, cramps and spasms. That's where I noticed it. The Triple Magnesium was kicking in for me when I was riding downhill. My arms, my legs, my fingers, they were all cramping after getting pinballed all day long down on the trails. I needed to recover so I could take them on all again day after day. Pillar's mission is exactly this, to get you and athletes to the start line in the best condition over and over again. Go across and try it, pillarperformance.shop, and use the code LITP for 15% off your first order. Or USA listeners, head across to thefeed.com slash pillar. Good sleep, good recovery. I don't care who you are. Everybody needs this. Give it a try. You guys, you seriously not going to regret this. Now, last thing I want to tell you guys about is our very own Life in the Peloton Club, The Pelo. I'm having a great time chatting with all our Pelo members over at The Pelo Chat, talking all things cycling, episodes, ideas, whatever comes up. It's been fun to be able to communicate with everyone so easily. Plus, there is a special Life in the Peloton Chronicles podcast series coming out once a month exclusively to The Pelo members. 
These are long format episodes that I'm doing with my old mate, Swain Tuft, where we're discussing interesting topics at length with some special guest interviews. And then, of course, there's our unfiltered banter as well. These have been so much fun. And there's lots more on offer too for the Pello members. Some affiliated brand discounts from Specialized, POC, Restrap, MAP, and more. Go across, sign up to the Pello. We've got two membership levels to suit your needs, the Echelon and the Doomline. I'll let you guys go across and check them out to find out a little bit more about them. Righto, let's get into it. Here we go. What is Enduro? Paul Vanderplug. We are at the top of Mount Macedon. Well, firstly, let's understand who Paul Vanderplug is. <laughs> this is... This could take all day. <laughs> 2013 Elimination. Is it Elimination Cross Country World Champion? Yeah, Eliminator. Eliminator, sorry. Yeah, that just I just eliminate people. But it means you're highly skilled about what we're about to do. And that's why I invited you out here. Thanks for coming out because I need some teaching. I need some lessons. I need to understand what the hell I'm about to get into. What are we going to do today? Yeah, I mean, you may have been in the world tour, but mountain biking, it's a pretty different beast. And uh, having a few pointers... It's quite handy. We're going to go and uh, check out some of these Mount Macedon trails. To be honest, I haven't been here in years, but it's sort of a central location for you and me to meet up and do some, do some trails. We've scoped out the first line, some four-metre doubles. We'll probably avoid those to start off and maybe work on some cornering and then build up from there. What are some things I should probably be thinking about going to this first trails session? Is it just like ride it and you can sort of assess what I need to do or just like what should I start with? I'm on the Stumpy Evo. It's about 160 travel, so something that I'm not used to either. And I'm on a Focus Jam Squared, if you'd like to know. I'm actually on an e-bike, so I've taken a bit of a bit of assistance. I think uh, you're you're racing in New Zealand. Is that what we're training you up for? Yeah, so I'm doing the New Zealand Mountain Bike Rally, and it's an enduro event. So, you know, mandatory eight-metre gap jumps and stuff like that. Well, <laughs> no, I think in New Zealand they have this great saying. It's called pre-ride, re-ride, and then free-ride. So we're going to implement that today. So pre-ride as in sort of just scoping the features, figuring out what the trail's all about, taking it quite easy, and then we'll re-ride to get a bit of flow in, and then... We'll do a bit of free riding and get stuck in, do a bit of cornering practice. I mean, I know you've done a lot of corners on the road, but on the dirt, it's a different beast. So it should be fun. Should I follow you or you follow me? We'll switch it around. I need to be able to observe you from behind to uh, see your technique. And so, and then you can observe me. It's sort of a bit of a cat and mouse sort of game down the, down the hill, but we're not going to be trying to set a Strava record down these descents. Like it's, it's about having a bit of fun working on a few skills, repeating corners if we need to to try and figure out how to... They call it puzzling in uh, mountain bikes. So you're trying to fit all the pieces of the puzzle together so you can link up a smooth, efficient run. I'm, you're probably racing blind though, so you're just going to have to learn how to decode the matrix. Full face or should I just go open open air? You probably want to practice a little bit in the full face because it's different to running a open face, but it's up to you today. We're not going to be going too hard, so your call. It's freezing, so I might wrap the face up. <laughs> just, 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 for, just for warmth, really. <laughs> All right, we've done a couple trails. What was that called, actually? That was board line. The thing that you picked up was feet position. I know, I'm a goofy foot or natural or what is all the terminology and what have you just told me last time up here? Yeah, so similar to skateboarding or snowboarding or any of those sort of sports, you get the chocolate foot forward as Hans Ray used to say, the famous mountain biker. So when your cranks are level, you either have a left foot forward or a right foot forward and we've concluded that Mitch is natural and I, which also makes sense, I'm goofy. So with the mountain biking, I when you're cornering, just like on a road bike, actually, Mitch, you want to chuck the outside foot down to open up your hips and be able to swing the hips a bit more in the corners. You gave me that advice last time as we just redid borderline, so we're sessioning, getting some good terminology happening here. We didn't quite send it yet. The thing was, I found it really hard to actually, I might sound like a bit of an idiot here, but it's, it's hard to put that in together because you've got a natural way of riding. You're thinking about the trail, you're thinking about the big gap jump coming, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I've got to put my foot down. I've got to do this and that as well. So plus I've got this full face on, just squeezing my head in. There's a lot of new stuff going on. What are you, how do you go about that? Like 
once we get on the trails and things start to get gnarly, you just let yourself go back to your used to, or you got to really train yourself to think about the feet. Well, when I followed you on the first run, I was like, oh yeah, this is something Mitch can work on because you just had your left foot parallel forward, which is the natural way to descend. And then I guess the progression of dropping the outside foot, you still have both feet on the pedals, a bit confusing trying to describe it just with audio. Normally we have a visual aid, but it just, yeah, it, it lowers your center of gravity, gets more traction out of the bike. So all of these little things just give you more traction, which is key when you're going down steep, loose, loamy descents like we just did. And you can tip it in. But I did appreciate the first corner after I gave you the teaching point, you put your inside foot down and just threw the bike on the ground and had your first crash. <laughs> yep, first touchdown. Luckily we were doing about 6k an hour at that point. Okay, so hey, put your outside foot down no worries Vandy put your inside foot down and crashes so it proves you know if you do opposite of what you I say you'll crash one thing people need to remember too with, with downhill or enduro whatever you want to call it it's actually still quite taxing because you got to get to the top of the hill every time on these big beautiful bikes so that's what we're doing now let's go on what you say we do in New Zealand what's the saying well the pre-ride then we just did the re-ride and now we can go do a free ride so get off the brakes a little bit get some speed sort of get that feeling of what sort of comfortable speed you can ride the trail at maybe in a race run maybe at the new zealand rally let's do some free riding take those brakes off well let's recap a couple things vandy because we've been out here for a couple hours now a couple things i want to ask you is the progression of the riding over the day i haven't noticed we've been going quicker but you did mention that we have been you would know how's the progression been of speed throughout the day yeah well it has actually been a bit of a baptism of fire because it was too cold to do skills up in the windy peak of uh, mount macedon here so i've kind of scrapped doing the stop start push back up sort of faffing around and we've just been doing a few teaching points on the climbs and then implementing those on a top to bottom descent which is actually i think got us into a good flow rhythm how have you found it yeah i really i really like it like i feel this sort of following someone i didn't really like it in the beginning because i sort of felt like i had to keep up with them and I push myself but what I'm noticing is especially following someone like you is it does make me think less and just allows me to do the trail and I naturally try and just keep up and got that guy who's like just in front like catch me catch me mate just catch me and I'm like always just trying to just be that little bit quicker than if I was on my own which is nice because I don't know if this is correct or not but the trail's sort of flowing a bit better with a bit more speed yeah I think that last round we've done that track four times now we've been sort of sessioning that one I was definitely a lot more off the brakes and trying to give you a bit more of a carrot dangling in front of you so you had probably had to push a bit more in the corners had to just get a little bit more off the brakes and then try and keep a bit more flow and as you just said like as you do that it actually feels good and that's why we love mountain biking a technical question now we we're speaking about it on the long ride up last time mullets not my mullet not my <laughs> beautiful golden mullet we're talking about bike mullets now something that i had no idea about just assume everyone's talking about my hair all the time but bike mullets we're talking about wheel sizes i'm riding a mullet of course but what's the difference and why have we seen that transition of the wheel sizes and these things called mullets and explain what that is i guess yes well i'm just looking across at your luscious mullet and your bike that is mulleted and uh, whoever's listening to this probably is quite confused but essentially mountain bikes back in the 90s and 2000s all mountain bikes had 26 inch wheels almost across the board front and rear and then 29 inch wheels got developed so everyone's gone with a bigger wheel and then 27.5 wheels got developed it's this weird evolution of the wheel size and there's different benefits to each wheel size and what we're saying with a mullet is we're using two different wheels wheel sizes so the front wheel is a 29er and in the Australian sort of slang business at the front and then the back wheel 27.5 inches so it's a bit more of a party at the back a bit more flickable a bit more fun I think is what they sort of describe the 27.5 in the rear and I'm currently riding a dual 29 inch wheel bike so my bike's all business it's quite funny because when I think of that I naturally think the 29 should be in the back you know the long flowing locks of a mullet it should be a penny farthing reverse you know that technically in my mind should be a mullet but you explain it really well don't know why 27.5 is more party the thing i'm noticing is and you said before about these trails it's an obvious thing i guess but i'm not well educated in this world is that these trails are 
rough and rugged. I know I'll let you explain what these trails are. And they're a bit more suited to what I'm going across to in New Zealand. You can't just, well, you can, I guess, train anywhere, but it is better to train different ways, different terrain, give you different skills. Is that right? Yeah, I think these trails are kind of more natural, hand-built is what they describe them as. Low environmental impact compared to what we're seeing in the big bike parks where they get excavators out and they put in huge berms and massive double jumps and big flowy rollers. So there's none of that here. It's just utilizing the natural terrain, the rocks, the rolling terrain of the soil, the gradient of the hill. So it's it's sort of similar how they make the trails in New Zealand, sort of really integrated into the nature. And these trails are just super fun. A little bit secret. We call them community built, uh, built by loving members of the community. And I think it's a perfect training ground for you to dial in your skills. Very reactive. Sometimes you'll be coming down the trail and features will just jump out of nowhere. A bit unpredictable. And that's what you need to be tuning in when you're doing blind racing, jumping out of helicopters, getting dropped at the top of mountains. A couple of questions on that before we start getting into this hill probably. These natural sort of mountain bike areas, I wouldn't call them parks, they're you know, they can be known as illegal trails too. I don't get that because you're just saying the sort of the environmental impact is less, yet they're more accepted to have these mountain bike parks. I guess, I don't know, it's probably an obvious answer. Why are people so pissed off with these illegal trails? They're getting sort of just cut in, just a small trail, not really doing much apart from just riding down. If a tree falls, you ride over it. Yeah, I am very confused by this also, Mitch, because I grew up in a small town called Mount Beauty at the base of Falls Creek, and all of our trails were hand cut, and the club just leases the land off the local landowner and those trails have been there since the 80s and they haven't changed too much super low impact everyone just goes and rides them in the community really good for health and fitness but but then like since i was a kid the narrative has changed so it's gone from just a mountain bike trail to an illegal mountain bike trail because now there's contractors who are professionally building trails all over australia in places like derby or eden or naruma and bright and falls creek all these locations it's a funny one because this is just what we used to call mountain biking as kids. We're riding a trail that's been built by a local passionate mountain biker. I guess that some of the trails are probably a bit more advanced, like you wouldn't take your children here to come and ride a bike because the people who are building the trails are building trails for their skill level or to try and tune in their skills. So there's less of a progression here than, um, say, if you're going and riding at Harcourt, which is the local mountain bike park to here. I guess just on that, finally, what sort of level are these trails? You know, I'm thinking they're still doable. They're not easy for me, don't get me wrong, but I'm thinking, yeah, this must be somewhat not intermediate, but it's definitely not black, double black. I don't know how you guys rank that stuff. What what am I doing today? What sort of level? Well, that's a whole nother can of worms. Trail classification. I guess based on the gradient and the features, we're kind of in dark blue terrain. But I would I would even say, and I don't want to pump your tyres up too much, but we are riding some black trails here. Like the steepness is what really throws a lot of people off. But you have already done a fair bit of cross-country mountain biking, which does involve gradient. So I guess the new sort of thing we're adding in here is a few more drops and jumps and other features, which does kind of bring it into like a, I would confidently say that 70% of the tracks we're doing here are black diamond. Well, that's just about a wrap, I reckon. We've probably, well, not probably, we've been out here for about three and a half hours, four hours. Yeah, I think from my point of view, Vandy, like, it's come a long way. Maybe I'm not riding the trails better, but I just feel more confident and more used to this bike anyway. I guess your opinion of me and the trails up here. My opinion of, I oh, bloody love you, mate. <laughs> yeah, love hanging out with you. You're a good dude. Yeah, the trails here are really fun. I think they're a perfect training ground. I think I said that earlier as well for what you're doing. Doing. A lot of natural stuff. The last trail we did was top secret, no Strava, so that's why we didn't Strava the ride. Uh, not that we forgot at the start of the ride to even turn it on. But no, I think we're just saying that you were feeling a bit more in your groove on that that final descent. And I'd like to commend you on saying, is this our last run? Or you didn't say, is this our last run at the top? Because that's a curse. Never say last run. So I'll be happy to chuck the bike in the back of a car after he said, oh, we'll do a couple more. That's a little trick for young players because you always crash on your last run. I mean, that's statistically basically kind of coincides with you crash and it's your last run and you're going to hospital so you can't really do another one anyway um, 
And what I was just saying before was you just need to kind of go back into that rhythm of riding your bike. Like we've broken down the components of riding. We've talked a lot about technique, but at the end of the day, we're just out here having fun riding our pushies and uh, you've been doing it for so many years. It's just a different version. Exactly right, mate. That's what I've enjoyed about today. It's the same idea, but so different today. Like it's shut up, do the trail and then just catch up on the way up. It's really nice. And we met a couple of people out here, Matt, Tali. They joined us for a bit. We shredded the trail and lost them somewhere out there. (laughs) And then we just moved on. That's now time to go get a refreshment, isn't it? Yes. Well, the uh, best bit part about these trails is we're right next to Mount Macedon Pub and it's got a beautiful range of beers and uh, hopefully a counter meal. But, I mean, that's very different to the road scene. We definitely had some great chats with some random people and everyone was very friendly. So, no, well done. You were riding really well towards the end. I was quite impressed. Tried to drop you a couple of times on the last run and looked back and you were right there. So, I think uh, you're ready. Said by the world champ. I made the jump over to New Zealand I'm getting closer to the rally I'm on the road with Matt Fairbrother down to Nelson let's find out a little bit more about this world of enduro well now we've actually had a bit of a bit of a session the Sava haven't we since we got in we went in sort of pot guys and then I got myself a chili con carne pie local delicacy didn't I yeah yeah I could smell that one <laughs> Smell smelled quite good not your favorite because uh you're actually a vego yeah yeah vego so so nine nine years no me <laughs> so not not a fan of the con carne pies oh, not, not not the biggest fan they're not not bothered by you digging into it <laughs> And then we went around to your place and we unpacked my bike, which is what we're going to sort of talk about now. What is Enduro, I'm sort of saying? I did some training with Vandy before I came across. He touched on some of the technical stuff, but I guess what we're mostly use this time is we're driving down the coast now. We're down, we're going to head down. Where exactly are we going? Um, so we're heading to Nelson via, via the coast. So it's the, the scenic kind of option. The other options inland. Yeah, this is the coast. So we might see some, some seals. Might might get you some lobster for dinner. Ooh. Maybe fish and chips, I don't know. Fish and another, chips? Another local delicacy, so yeah, we'll see where it takes us. It's nice. I like being on the road with you. We've already had a fairly good chat already, so I was like, let's pull the mic out. Let's actually try and record some of this stuff, because all I'm trying to do is pick your brain. Firstly, to explain to myself what this sport is, all the technical stuff, but also to everyone listening. So when we get down to the New Zealand mountain bike rally, we're sort of ready. We're ready with the technical stuff. I guess let's start off with Enduro. EWS Enduro World Series, is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's actually now called the EDR. Don't know what that stands for. I feel like the EWS had more of a meaningful name, but it's now the EDR. It's just the discipline code. So I guess downhill is DHI, XC is XEO, but it's just the code they they now use. So essentially is you start off at cross country, which is what I did last year, you know, Cape Epic maybe being the pinnacle of it. Is the next step enduro? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, the next level up. And I'd say it's a big jump up in terms of it's mainly descent focused. So you're only timed on the downhills, but you do have to get yourself to the top of the hill before you can go down. So typically these are, are big days in the mountains. And, you know, you're winching yourself up to the hill on these big mountain bikes, and then you're going downhill as quick as you can. So in my eyes, I like to think of this as what you just do in the weekend with your mates. You just spend the whole day biking up and down the hill and taking your time going up, and then you're blasting uh, on the way down the hill. Where did it come from? Because, you know, you, you, we've had downhill and cross country pretty much came into the sport, the UCI sort of time at the same time. And then enduro is relatively new, isn't it? Yeah, it's definitely the newest discipline. I don't exactly know where it was born or, or why, but I assume it's just because, like, this is what people were doing with their yeah. mountain bikes. They'd go out with their mates and they'd just bike up and down the hill. And then, of course, you know, with the way the world works, it got turned into a competitive kind of sport and it's taken off in the last yeah I don't know five or so years and now it's a UCI governed discipline what's the difference I know it might sound obvious but I'm sort of thinking well if you don't get timed uphill and you can take as long as you want why does it make it any different to downhill racing you know like downhill is you get I guess a ski lift up there or however they get to the top of the mountain I don't know what's the difference then because you're only timed on the downhill run is the course different does the fatigue add up over the day and that plays a role I don't know I've never really been in that situation riding up a hill all day long yeah so I guess it's somewhat in the name. It's, I guess, what you can endure. So the days are long, 
Oh, what um, you can endure. Yeah, right, yeah. That's where it comes yeah. from. Right. Then we, then we, I, I suppose that's a guess, a plan words maybe. Yeah. But yes, the, the days are long. Like, you'd be out on the hill for maybe six to even ten hours potentially. And quite often you'll only get to one lap of the descent, at least at the at a world level, you only get to do one lap of what you're going to descend. So where that kind of differs, if you compare it to downhill, is with downhill, you'll get to multiple laps of that downhill. So in downhill, you'll know exactly where all the corners are, where all the technical sections are. So you mean you the training in the days before and you only get one run on the race day? Yeah. Multiple race runs? You you only, only get one of each. So you only get to do one scouting lap and then you get to do one lap which is your timed lap. In Enduro? Yeah. But what about in downhill? In downhill, you, there's multiple days leading up to the, to the actual competition day. So, you know, you could even do up to 10 laps as an example. You know that course inside and out in downhill. Right. Whereas in the e- EWS, you just you only get one lap. And honestly, you, you're only kind of searching for the key segments where you have to choose a line or you've got to know if there's a, a gap jump or something. Um, so it kind of, in the EWS it's more, uh, there's a bigger focus on your base skill and how you actually are as a, as a mountain biker, but you can't hide, your, your technical skill definitely shows. <laughs> it's, sounding, it's sounding like it's somewhat harder than downhill, am I wrong? Uh, but downhill's I, more what? More, you've got to be it, more fearful. Yeah, downhill is more Feeler, pure, pure speed, so it's how quick you can go, whereas in the EWS it's more, uh, you've it's more the complete package of you as a mountain biker. Like you don't, you don't actually know where you're going most of the time. So it's how quick can you just decipher that section, but and how quick can you then do it? So it's a lot more kind of you're making it up as you go. So why are you on the mountain for eight eight hours then? If it's only one run, why are you up there for so long? Oh, that you do multiple runs in a yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, my bad. Yeah, so there's multiple stages. So. Each event is going to change. Um, so most of the time at a, at a World Cup level event, there's about five or six stages. But then at local events, there can be more than that or less. Um, in a day. In a, in a day. But then you can also get some other events which are multi-day. With multiple stages in a day. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, for instance, this what we're doing now, and I don't know where this this stands, the the rally, but for what I understand, this between four and six stages each day, and we're here for six days. So is that sort of... Is that... How's it working? Yeah, yeah. So as an example, on the first day, I know there's seven stages. Right. I think on day two, there's only four stages. And then I'm not too sure after that. But in total, I think there's maybe 34 stages off the top of my head. So you go down and you ride to a different area of the hill or you just sort of do a track that's sort of in the same, more or less the same spot? Yes and no. Some days it's all confined to the, the same zone. And then other days you're going all over the place. So you get down the bottom, you sort of see someone else come down. You're like, oh, mate, oh, how'd you go? Well, let's cruise up the hill. And you're chatting yeah. the whole way up the hill. Yeah. Probably takes you, what, 45 minutes to get back to the top or something? Oh, depends how the hill is. <laughs> There's going to be some big hills and some smaller hills and sometimes even between the, the stages there won't be a hill. So yeah, it's super casual though. I think that's the best part about the sport is that it's social and that you know, you're like, you're timed down the hill but once that time ends, once the stage ends, you can just catch up with your mates and talk about how it went for you. Is there anyone from the sort of the mountain bike world, you know, maybe a bit more on the downhill side of things that don't really like enduro because it's like look i don't really want to be riding around on my big mountain bike all day or it's just sort of like that's what you do when you go out training anyway that everyone just gets around it yeah i think it's definitely well supported i in my opinion i don't think there's anyone that's against it and we've even seen quite a few like people that focus on downhill specifically move over to to the side of the sport and even some xc's moving xc to to the EWS so yeah it's quite quite accepted it's just yeah honestly I think it's just what most people would do in their spare time for fun on a bike well let's run into some of the equipment the bikes they are big bikes well they're not big bikes they're called small bikes aren't they well they big bikes oh it depends what you're used to <laughs> right yeah because I was t- I was talking to someone the other day and they said oh look you probably can't do these tracks on these small bikes like we're riding and like oh, this thing feels pretty big to me what's what, what are they considered they, I mean, a medium bike. These, these <laughs> bikes, <laughs> I don't know. In, in terms of capability, these bikes are made to do it all, which means they're going to have their weaknesses and they're also going to shine in other parts. But, yeah, these bikes shouldn't hold you back on anything, but for some things, they won't be the best tool for the jobs. And a, an example of that is, um, like, a purely focused downhill bike is nine times out of ten going to be quicker than one of these bikes going down the hill. Because of the suspension or... 
Yeah, like, yeah. Purely the, suspension or? Oh, uh, I guess, yeah, suspension, design of the bike. And yeah, mainly there's just a lot more suspension. So you can hit things harder and because of that, go quicker. And also you just get a lot more confidence out of a downhill bike. Is it going to be stuff like this week that you couldn't get down on, say, like a cross-country bike? I guess you, that's that's like pers- a personal kind of question. It just depends how skilled you are. Like, like What about you? I'd like to think so. <laughs> But like de- definitely at a at a world level, um, there's no way you could do it. No, like like any of the XC athletes competing on a world level, they'd have no issues uh, on an XC bike. Uh, what what they're competing on at the World Cups is definitely on par in terms of te- technicality with what we're going to be doing this week. It's just they might not be going as quick and might not be having as much fun as us. Yeah, right. What about the um, like the tyres and things like that? What are, what are things that are going to be really important for me or people who are understanding enduro to understand the really important elements of the bike? You know, we spoke about suspension, tyres. I'm learning a lot about you even told me hey you need to get some downhill casing tires which i didn't know what the hell was someone told me and then i worked it out so stronger tires you know massive knobs on the uh, grip what else are other things that are really important when you when you're thinking about your own bike and the setup what are the things that you are the main importance for you i'd say in my mind there's two important key kind of uh, component choices um and, and set up choices which is suspension and then tyres so suspension obviously is that's kind of what's going give to you, give you the confidence to push it's going to it's going to dampen the bumps and it's going to you know it's going to keep your wheels spinning wheels kind of keeping <laughs> yeah it's just going to soak up the bumps like if you don't have suspension you're going to know about it so uh, you want that to be well set up and that takes like a lot of time and testing and something you might not have done no perfectly by the sounds of it not at all i was Uh, just (laughs) only discovering some oh right that can adjust it there the other day so like suspension is quite difficult to understand because if you've got a high spec suspension platform for an example you're going to have maybe like four or five knobs to play with and if you don't know what they're doing you don't know what they affect you're just going to get yourself stuck in a big hole you know suspension will definitely help you but it can definitely not help as well if you don't know what you're doing so if you don't have it set up right is it a real hindrance or it just won't feel as good both at all oh really yeah well so i could have been completely set up wrong yeah yeah just still <laughs> rip yeah, the tr- yeah totally the so i mean first of all like you're gonna it's gonna feel awful and then it's not gonna be working as well to, to perform. support you. Yeah, so it could either be like the suspension could be moving too slow, could be moving too fast, and that can upset the bike, upset your body position, and then make you slower and more unsafe, less confident. Or it could, and it can also be too harsh and too hard, and it's just not going to feel nice. It's going to make you tired. It's going to make you work harder. So you just want to be working in line with that suspension and make sure you're working together as a as like a, a pair. Are you still setting yours up all the time and changing as you evolve as a rider as the bike's change or you just sort of know exactly no i know how to get it exactly how i want every time yeah totally like it's something i'm still still learning and it's something that i guess changes depending on the course where you are how oh steep really it, is, it how will change the course yeah um so if like if i know the place super well i might change a couple of the settings uh to suit that place but in an event like this where there's you know 30 plus stages i'm just going to keep it in a setting that I know works for multiple conditions just so I'm not thinking about that and just know it's gonna gonna work as I expect it to. And you said there was something else that you find really important, suspension uh, and and tires. tires. Tires is a big one. That's obviously the only contact you have with, with the dirt. So apart from your body. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hope hopefully not the body. <laughs> yeah, we'll find that I guess this week. So there's like so many so many tire combos and I mean that that's a we could talk for hours hours on that, but I've got a tire combo that um, I'm happy with, and I never change that. Really? I, I just keep it the same because I know... I'm I know, even in wet and dry. No, like some people will, but I prefer just to get to know this tire combo super well and just so I know how it's going to behave. So that's super important to me. But and, and like with how mixed these events are, you can be in so many conditions in a single day that... Like, an example, wet tyres, they're only good in the wet. And if it's not wet and sticky and muddy, they just don't work. In what respect? They're slippery or they're just slow? Yeah, exactly. And they're, they're, the mud tyres, they're quite spiky. So yeah. they don't actually have much contact with the dirt. 
if it's not muddy. Right, if you're on a compacted dirt, yeah. they may be like in slime yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. They go all like spongy and they go, the mo- the, the feeling just isn't, isn't nice at all. And you'll, yeah, it won't actually help you if it isn't super muddy. So if I was to ever use those muddy, the, the mud tires, it would have to be like super muddy and I'd have to be certain that it would stay muddy. And they also don't work well on stones or anything other than dirt. So Right, so the combo you've got at the moment is a pretty good all-round combo, except unless it's like sloppy mud. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But even if it was slop and sloppy mud, nine times out of ten, I'd, I'd keep them just because I know how they behave. Something I'm sent with. What about pressure? You know, tire pressure is super important in all forms of cycling. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is a, a big topic too. Um, and I'd say nine times out of ten circumstances, I keep the same same numbers of my tires. Twenty two and twenty four psi. Have you got a little gauge to measure yeah, it exactly? Yeah, you've got a tire gauge. But if I know the place is, I don't know, super. If there's a chance to to damage your wheel or puncture tyre I'll go go harder seems pretty uh, hard 22 yeah I mean, yeah. yeah right or I'd, I'd say that's more on the softer side like, right I've been probably too soft uh, then on my side but I mean once again this is another thing it depends if you've got tyre insert oh, so yeah yeah, yeah the tyre the inserts are there I guess it's a, a layer of foam inside your tyre which is going to save the wheel it's like a bump stop in case you hit something hard enough so it doesn't dent or or smash your wheel so and that also actually saves the the tire so you won't get a snake bite puncture um, and it also in hard corners it'll also support the tire so it doesn't fold uh, so it's they're super if positive your pressure's things. super low as yeah, well yeah yeah exactly so you can technically go lower with inserts because the chance of getting a puncture is lower and then since if it's if your tire's lower, it's going to fold more in corners, so that insert's going to hold it up, keep it more stable and sturdy. And I guess the only big downside is the weight with inserts, is they they do tend to weigh quite a bit. So other things on the bike, the dropper, I know it's a pretty obvious one for you, but something pretty foreign to me. And getting used to that last year on the cross country bike, is there a right and wrong time to use the dropper, or it just stays down once you hit a trail and that's it? Um, yeah, I, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, that's something I wouldn't be able to live with that. And you start, well, typically, I mean, it's all situational, but typically it would stay down for the whole of the downhill. But sometimes in these stages, there can be an uphill. And depending on how long the uphill is, you might put it up. So maybe if it's a a 30-second climb and you know you're not going to be able to stand up for the whole whole 30 seconds, you might put it up to, to help you out and save the legs. But typically, it just stays down the whole time. Do you ever get leg fatigue? Like, that's something that I'm getting used to is that static leg position. I was telling you I'm keeping the, the feet probably too long in that halfway position there rather than dropping a, an ankle on the corner and things like that. Do you ever get that sort of leg fatigue for just holding your legs in that still position or you've been doing it for so long that your legs are strong enough? I've, I've been doing it for so long now that it takes a huge descent to get that feeling. But, but yeah, definitely, like, a few years ago, um, I definitely had that had that feeling and... Also, like, even in my feet as well, uh, I guess the forearms is the big one. That's usually the first thing, first thing right. which fatigues for me. We, we call it arm pump, and you, your forearms just pump up so much, and it's hard to hold on. It's hard to push. Some of the lingo I'm going to have to learn this week. I'm starting to pick up on a few things. Pump. Have you had arm pump before? Uh, I, I, I haven't heard. I've heard of it, but I didn't know exactly how to use it. How long have the descents you've been doing been? I did one descent in... Um, outside of Hillsville uh, in Marysville which is called the Cascades Trail and it's a it's one of those epic trails so it's like a two and a half hour but it's broken into sections so you do like I don't know 10 minutes and then like 15 minutes but I do remember on this one in the middle of it there was some big drops I was like I don't know if I can take this anymore like I was my arms were sore my legs were sore and my fingers and I think it was because I'd already been riding for an hour so I'd already built up the fatigue and then I hit this long sector um, so I know exactly what you're talking about but I don't know what, what kind of length are these stages time wise uh, some of the bigger ones we'll be, we'll be doing this week uh, I'd say are going to be at least over five minutes okay so five minutes of like hard downhill you're going to be getting pounded by the bike and it's going to be steep and you're going to going to be signed out the corners and yeah you th- you're definitely going to know what arm pump is by the end of the week so five minutes is, is decent yeah yeah it's a, a big hill um yeah <laughs> you'll you'll know by the end of it what about overseas in the in the world cups is it that sort of length yeah i'd say the standard length is about could be between four to six minutes uh, i think the biggest stage i've done is 11 minutes and that was over a thousand meters of descending and I saw that, you know, when you're going out with mates and things like that, you might stop on a corner and you rest and have a chat about the next segment and whatever. In this, obviously, it's timed, so you're not doing that, are you? No, so you, you'll only stop once you 
got to the bottom of the hill at the bottom of the stage, uh, you, won't, you won't be waiting up for a mate in the middle of the stage when, when you're being timed. Is there any kind of etiquette or respect that I should be aware of? If someone catches up to you, just do your best to get out of the way. Without crashing? I'd say, yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't want to hold someone up. And actually, nine times out of ten, if you let them pass and then jump on their, on their wheel, you'll actually end up going quicker as well because when you follow people you tend to go their speed and yeah just be quicker than you would normally do you like seeing somebody in the distance and using his motivation to try and catch them yeah yeah definitely who doesn't like yeah. there's always a good goal to have someone to catch up to yeah i know but like it could almost push you or it would take you out of your focus you know like sometimes i feel like when it, well especially the other way around if i have someone on my ass and i know they're not trying to pass for instance just the other day we were just doing some training i like using that word some riding and the guy just said, oh, I'll just go behind you. I, I didn't like it because I could hear him there. Yeah. I know he wasn't trying to pass me, but it felt like he was trying to push me faster than I wanted to go. Do you like that pressure when someone's behind you? I think it's situational. Like, sometimes it's good. Sometimes you know, like, now, now it matters, now it counts, and now I have to go. But other times, then, if you're not in the mood, then I guess not. Because I guess, like, with going downhill, and obviously it's like, you've got a chance of falling off, and you've got to be so in tune with what you're doing that if you aren't in tune in that moment, it's just not good. And, uh, you know, the chance of coming off is quite high. So it just matters with how you're feeling. I think. What happens when you come off? Um, I'm sure you've come off in the middle of a in the middle of a, a race, and and then you've, you're still halfway down or whatever. Like I know you probably just win those signs when you're not fully busted up, bit of a like dust off and sort of cruise down and just get it done. How do you get down? Yeah, I think actually a good point to say is you there is actually a technique to fall off and fall off. Oh, else, good to know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So like, if you get flying off the bike, um, just like keep going with that momentum. Like if you're if you're flipping, just go with the flips. I wouldn't. Most of the time, you don't want to like stop yourself flipping. You just want to like dissipate all that energy over as much time as you can. And usually that will like um, the chances of hurting yourself will go down just because you aren't you aren't stiffening up and yeah you aren't like stiffening up. You aren't putting your hand out because uh, like it's so easy to do a collarbone, to do like a skateboard in your hand, or just yeah anything to do with your hand and arm. So just basically go with it and don't stop yourself just tuck up in a ball and go with it like that's the best thing to do even though it's, it's quite hard to do in that moment have you thought about it in the moment after you've you know you got told this or you learned this have you had this sort of do you remember those moments of training yourself to embrace the fall i yeah i i mean i don't know why but i do it quite instinctively now to the point where like sometimes it almost looks fake like maybe i didn't need to do it then yeah. but but it's definitely i, I feel confident that it, it saved me a few times I think it's it's quite an important thing to keep in mind, and I like especially if you watch some more like the dirt jumpers, the guys doing big jumps when they fall, they just they keep doing all these tumbles and flips and stuff, and that's just to dissipate that energy and momentum. It's almost like making it sort of like a show, and like you said, it looks worse. Like oh, geez, he's putting it on this guy. Yeah, you know, but it's like just to to use all that speed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it definitely saves the body. But yeah, when I actually fall off mid-stage, it's, I'm never happy about it, but it kind of turns into a big panic to, to get on the bike as quick as possible and then just go without thinking about it. I think most of the time, focus enough where it doesn't affect me afterwards. Like, I don't have a loss of confidence. I just get back on the bike and I'm back into that mission. I think the only thing which sucks is if you twist your bar or, like, twist a lever. You might have to, like, quickly just jump off the bike and twist your lever or twist your bars back. Or if you're maybe close to the bottom of the hill, you just keep biking down the hill with your bars twisted. Because you want to keep that time as low as possible for the cumulative time of the day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you just want to keep moving. Um, so maybe if you fell off, like, at the top of the hill, it would make sense then to, to get out of tall and quickly untwist your stem but if it was near the bottom of the hill just keep going with it twisted and then you just need to get down to the bottom as quick as you can well we've got a training session coming up maybe tomorrow we might get a chance to go out but definitely the next day down in nelson won't we yeah yeah definitely got that lined up you're looking forward to following me down yeah it should be a good laugh party train <laughs> you can keep yeah. up yeah Let's have a quick check in what we're doing. It's probably about 7 in the morning. And uh, now that's a great idea, let's head up Mount Fife, is it? And uh, let's do this trail before we head up to Nelson this morning. We stopped over at his uncle's place and uh, grabbed us ourselves some lobster last night. Oh, this is going to be really hard. All right, stopped on this corner. Seriously steep. I can't ride and talk. So tell us about this track, this mountain, what we're doing. Uh, yeah, this is Mount Fife, and there's only one descent, descent up, one descent down. And it's just a classic blue flow descent. Lots of boomed corners, lots of pumps, 
lots of up and downs and be a lot of fun. Training day one, it's all the way up. This is one part I've underestimated about enduro. You got to get up. Yeah, you got to get up <laughs> on these big bikes. Well, mate, first impressions, we've just come down uh, Fife, is it? Yeah, Mount Fife. Mount Fife, and yeah, look, a, a blue run apparently, and it felt okay. I certainly wasn't setting any Stravas down there, but nothing I don't think I couldn't handle, but lots of technique I learned from you. Um, How did you feel down there? Yeah, that was a, a good fun one. Uh, lots of corners, and it's, like stuff like that's actually quite quick. I mean, quite hard, because you can go so quick, but too quick. Uh, there's so many tight corners so you've got to keep on your toes and yeah it's quite exciting that stuff it was quite fun following you because you were trying to sort of keep me within arm's length you were just up on the <laughs> on the back wheel most of the time the whole way down there it was pretty good to watch like not necessarily the trick stuff but yeah that was also good to watch but in terms of what I could take on board just the way we came to the hairpin the way you were able to get up almost on the on the top of the corner before you cut in on the you know, on the on the sharp turn, um, on the apex of the turn, you're up. So it was it was really interesting, and I was thinking to myself, right, I'm going in tired, and you know, it's not necessarily about speed, but it just allowed the, the trail to follow a lot better. Not saying that I could do what you were doing, but it just helped me open my eyes up to a better way to take the corners there. Yeah, yeah, that, exactly that. Going wider on the corners most of the time means you can hold that speed better, use that berm better, and then essentially go quicker because you'll take more speed out of the corner, and also use less effort. I was saying it's a bit depressing really it took us probably a good solid 30 minutes to get up there and it was like real steep I mean 20 plus percent for a couple of K um, and then it's all over so quick and I feel like I, I sort of just started to get the hang of things and I'd love to just the trail to go on for another 10 minutes or do it again or two or three more times but it's like I don't know if I want to attempt that climb again it's a bit like that always is it yeah and that's why people get e-bikes I think that's the that's the key to that one, get an e-bike. Well, you didn't get to see me very much, but first impressions, I guess. Yeah, we've been a lot of talk so far. Thoughts? No, I thought you went quite quite well. Um, better than I thought, to be honest. You, you kind of maybe talked yourself down a bit too much, but I thought you went solid. Yeah, you're keeping up, like, most of the time. I couldn't have gone a whole lot quicker on that, but at the same time, that didn't have anything technical, so we've still got a lot more to find out. It's... Friday, still a couple of days before the race, but uh, today is our training day. We sort of penciled in, but actually we've ticked off a lot already. Yesterday was a really good day for me anyway. We did slab drop, mini slab drop, huge for me. And we did a double black. We sessioned some corners. So I guess just give me a bit of a rundown on yesterday, what your idea was taking me out there and what we did, and then what you're thinking today. Yeah, so I kind of chucked you in the the deep end there and took you on a double black to begin with, but it was super good to see, like, what you were were capable of and what was maybe, like, getting you scared. So I kind of picked up on the fact you needed to go a little bit wider on some corners to open them up and then look towards the exit. And then the other big one was moving your arms. So <laughs> you're quite locked out in the arms, not not working with the bike and not fluid at all. So, yeah, moving the arms is a big one. And I think those are the two main focuses. Uh, yeah, the other, there's, like, a few other small things, but they're, like, too small to even consider at the moment. So what are we going to do today, then? So yesterday, I don't think that trail yesterday we did a uh, smasher, I think it's called. He's going to be on it. It was nice to do on the on the rally, I mean. But today we might be actually doing a bit of recon, which is uh, probably could be pretty handy for the rally coming up. Yeah, so we're over at the Codgers Mountain Bike Park. So one of the days is based out of here. So that's our morning. And then in the afternoon, we're going to jump over to Cable Bay Adventure Park and we're going to get some shuttles up there and check out more stages. So, yeah, you should have a good idea of what's happening uh, after today. And we haven't touched on it yet, but maybe while we're, or you're cruising, you're on an e-bike. And I want you to explain why you'd be on an e-bike today because you've got a pretty cool adventure coming up. The rally, not to say anything about the rally, that it's not hard or anything, but you just like to do things a bit differently. Yeah, so this event, the normal way to do it, it's all supported. So what that entails is all the competitors competitors will be getting shuttles up the hill, even getting some helicopters up the hill, but I've chosen to do it completely unsupported. So I'll be biking up all the all climbs, no helicopter for me, uh, no accommodation either, no food for me. I won't be taking any food handouts like all the other competitors will be, so I'm just going alone, completely solo, and fending for myself out there. Self-supported, you know, completely self-supported, and the reason why you're on an e-bike today is you've got a big mission this week, and you're nice enough to take me out here and do some training, but there's no need need for you to be using bickies you need well and truly need the next six days
feel like we're in the highest point in Nelson practically. Well, actually, as I turn around, there's another massive mountain there. But it was a bit of a climb up and a great view from up here. We're about to do our second trail. So you followed me down the last trail, which was a black. It was pretty techy. I'm not going to lie, but it wasn't unrideable. What's the immediate feedback, mate? You were quite sketchy. <laughs> it was quite it was quite a tight and quite a loose one. Doing quite well. And now this, this is going to be actually in the rally. So now we're doing a bit of course recon. Well, the last one was too. So uh, what are we expected here? Uh, I've never done this one, but... It's a dark blue, so I think it should be. It should be. It's going to be a bit easier, easier than that last one. Maybe a bit wider, a bit more like machine built. So it should be a lot quicker jumps. Maybe. Well, let's go check it out. All right, we're here at Cable Bay. This is something new to me, is getting driven on a bike ride. I'm loving this. Look, I actually jumped in the back of cars quite often in my road career too because I would just get dropped and it's not quite a nice feeling as this because you're sort of a bit depressed. This is fun. You get sort of driven to the top, the hard work's done, and no one's feeling guilty about it. Shannon's driving us. Shannon, what's it like being a shuttle driver? Is it fun coming up and down, hearing everyone's stories? Yeah, yeah, it's super fun. And as well as hearing everyone stories you get to meet people from all over New Zealand and international as well we've had some pretty big names come through the park as well so it's super exciting yeah just getting to meet everyone and just talk about bikes for a few hours. Do you get FOMO though because you're like in the car and you're sort of getting that feeling like everyone's giddy coming up the mountain here we go we're gonna do this on the trail and you're suddenly like all right I'll just sort of cruise down in the full drive I guess. Yeah the FOMO is definitely real especially on those hero dirt days. You're uh, tying the bikes up and you're looking at the tread on all the tyres and you can just tell that it's just absolutely perfect out there and those days are they're pretty hard to swallow and then definitely we'll try and push and get for a ride after work on those runs. We're also joined here by Eric, a mountain bike legend from what I understand, but you're actually here volunteering for the rally, the rally event, and trying to sneak in a few runs as well. That's right, yeah. Coming down from Bellingham, Washington, USA. It's currently snowing where I live right now, so I thought I'd escape to sunny New Zealand and kind of couch surf my way through a couple weeks with Trans NZ and then the New Zealand mountain bike rally this week. And uh, yeah, just part of the volley crew. Normally I'd race, but uh, got to save my money for later in the season. <laughs> So what happened at Trans NZ? Did you get up there? Did you have a good one? Yeah, no, it was sweet. I actually finessed my way into volley and race, but then came down with a bit of a bug on like the second day. So then I just kind of chilled and rode and hung out for the rest of it. So yeah, it's early in our mountain bike season. So got to save the energy or do ma what Matthew does and just go all in at all times. No energy savings. <laughs> all right, let's get into it. We're almost at the top now. Pretty sick day up at Cable Bay. So many trails I've done today. So much time on the mountain bike I've been, downhill enduro stuff. This has just been a whirlwind. But we're back at Freehouse, which is just like a pretty cool little pub, actually. We're having a meal, we're having a beer, and we're talking about trails. And I think it's a bit of a topic. We've also got Cam McKenzie here, who is an ex-downhill rider, but now loves a bit of trails as well, but he's taking photos of us today as well. We're talking trails, so what I was trying to decide is, like, you've got your machine-built stuff, you've got your natural stuff, and we're just talking the differences. I guess, Cam, tell me a little bit about each of them and what the differences are, and the, I guess the positive and negatives of what's happened with trails over the years. I guess did they all start natural and then machine-built sort of come into it? I guess it's so complicated, right? Like, as mountain biking or cycling gets more and more popular, kind of like, almost to some degree, like gentrification with cycling and mountain biking, in certain areas, uh, your, what you have on offer in terms of your trails is a byproduct of what your area is wanting, and sometimes it's not always as a result of, you know, community efforts, it might be external factors, commercial operations, councils, etc. So all over New Zealand, especially now, you're getting a real diverse mix, and not always a balanced mix of the two different styles, you know, bike park, buff, polished, flow trail type stuff at one end of the spectrum, and then somewhere like where we are in Nelson, a lot more uh, hand dug, natural, native, rough, raw, a uh, style of trail like kind of what for a lot of us we see mountain biking as sort of the the pure trails it's interesting because i get the feeling like 
for instance, back in Australia, the, the natural stuff is deemed illegal because they're made by community. The funny thing I noticed here is we were at a park today and it was natural as hell. I love how they've kept it to that to that essence of the natural feel. Is that because of the pressures from what people want here or is it because... You know, they just don't want to do machine, or why, why do you think it's stayed that way? Oh, it's it's so tricky. I mean, there's massive differences around land access and, and I guess, mountain biking culture between New Zealand and Australia. So somewhere like here, Cable Bay, for one, where we were today, is by and large community built. The owners there purchased the land way back when, and that trail we rode and shot this afternoon, Gamble, as they said, was named after or inspired by the Gamble to buy the property. And they brought and purchased that block of land we were riding you know, 600 metres vert, huge big block of land, specifically to build a, a cycling and adventure tourism product. And then that land, people, the locals, local riders saw a huge potential in the terrain there. And so everybody got behind the owners there, Shannon and, and Richard, and offered their time up to build the trails. And so here in New Zealand, and this is the difference, is a lot of the riding and the trail centres here are built by the community built by influential people, people who want to ride certain styles of stuff. So they go and build it, and then the community, the riders follow. Whereas in Australia, I suppose, with the way in which land access is managed, you're getting it the opposite way. Like, it's taking people to invest money and work with, you know, government stakeholders to purchase land first, build these bike parks, these commercial operations that typically are targeted more towards the masses, and so are you know, your greens and blues, your flow trails, first and then any natural sort of progression in the sport, people learn people want more, and that's how then in Aussie you're getting a lot more of your natural built, illegal type stuff popping up is because people want more, whereas here in New Zealand it's almost the opposite way, it's you know, it's what comes first, the chicken or the egg and it's opposite for us. That's really interesting. It's really interesting. And I like that the fact that sort of the community knows already what people will eventually want and they've stuck to that. I guess, Matt, now you've been around the world. I'm only talking, and I'm sure Cam has also been around the world, but I'm only talking about Australia and New Zealand now in general. Let's talk about the general sense. What is happening around the world in the enduro scene? What do you normally see? You know, is it this machine built stuff? Is it more natural like you get here coming from New Zealand? Is that an advantage riding all these loose natural trails? Or is it a disadvantage? You going over to Europe and understanding, I need to learn a whole new technique now. Yeah, so definitely overseas, I think you see two kinds of things. The newer stuff is all bike park stuff so a lot more machine built a lot more flow whereas the old stuff is typically like old hiking paths um, that have then been turned into mountain biking descents so that stuff is is quite pure and that's what most of the EDR, EWS stuff uses and then a smaller mix of that machine built stuff which is more you know commercial use so definitely having that like that hand built stuff at home is a huge asset to then head overseas and tackle that tackle that old hiking pass that we, we see so often over there. What about the scene, like the world scene, you know, like the EDR, the EWS, those guys, the top tier guys, the guys racing, what do they prefer? What's the general consensus? Oh look, me just being a nuffy and I like it, you know, I like the natural sort of feel and maybe someone else likes the, the machine built, blah blah blah. But what about the top end? What does the guys at the top end want? I'd say yeah, definitely definitely on the hand built side of things. But that's like not to say that no one likes like you know, big machine built stuff. But if we had to pick one or another, I'd say 90% of people would pick the hand built stuff. Just, it's pure, you know, that's what my mountain biking is to us. Like, we just want to go up to the top of a mountain and then find our own, own line down the hill and, yeah, that's what we want. Well, we're at the top of Smasher. This is Nelson's infamous climb uh, we're just setting up the GoPro to record this supposable double black grade 6 but the saying on the sign grade 5 I don't know if I believe that and we're going to go testing down this climb or descent trail whatever you want to call it and see where I stand before I start the rally and then come back at the end of the week and see how the time goes let's see what happens down here hopefully I can record one at the bottom and I'm not too messed up Well, we're back at the Freehouse pub here. I didn't say before, Cam was with me, to do our test run of Smasher. Well, 
Well, I'm talking. I'm talking in the mic, so it's not all that bad. But, yeah, I came unstuck. I came unstuck on one of the hardest corners. It's a sharp turn back, steep, with a big root drop in it. I know what happened. I just sort of... I know, Cam, you saw the video. Lucky I got the GoPro on. You saw the video. What's your prognosis of what happened? My uh, analysis. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing super sinister, really. Just a very classic over the bars, tuck the front wheel kind of crash like we all do. Like you're saying, Matt's been teaching you all these things all week. Get high, stay wide, bit of this, bit of that. But just one of those corners where no matter what you know, you just got to read the trail. And unfortunately, it was kind of just like everything came to a head at once. You went wide on a corner, you want to stay tight in. And <laughs> you came into it turning rather than square. And it's tight little corner, too much front brake. And yeah, you just kind of came into the corner off the drop with your front wheel crossed up, grabbed a bit too much front brake and just spat yourself over the bars. <laughs> and you're in front of me at that point, only just sort of like about 10 metres in front. What did it sound like? You, you listen to it, you're like, oh, here we go. Well, I came through it and went, oh, that was a pretty shit little corner. And I kind of got through it, looked back at you, kind of wondering how you're going to get on with that one because it just such that it was going to unstick most people. <laughs> and I think I heard you before I saw you. <laughs> just, it was just, oh, it was, if you've ever had to destroy a helmet where you're jumping on it, you're stomping on it, you're smashing it with a mallet or whatever it is, it's just a certain, certain crunch <laughs> of a chili bin just getting and getting rinsed and it, yeah just it was just the crunch of your helmet as your head's just smoking some rock <laughs> oh yes look the helmet is a bit busted up so that that clears up one thing for me i was like am i gonna go the full face or the half face helmet and look it looks like the half face is out of it it's it's busted up it's gone so it's, it's out of commission full face it is probably for the best um after today's little off but we got down the bottom didn't set the world's fastest time, so that's a positive as well. Looks like I can smash that cover that day. Well, what do you think? You ready to rock and roll? You ready to take on the New Zealand mountain bike rally? Or some enduro downhill? Or some downhill? Or even mountain bike? Or maybe not at all. Was it just interesting for you to find out about a different scene? That was really cool. Gearing myself up for the New Zealand mountain bike rally. That episode is coming to you soon in a couple of weeks. We've got the Life in the Peloton communique next week talking about the classics. But after that, we've got the rally recorded as well. Come on the road with me. Now you're a little bit more educated like me. You're ready to hear the lingo and come on the road. Big thanks goes out to Red Bricks Media. Of course, MAP our major partner here at Life in the Peloton, and you guys for listening. I love hearing from you, so feel free to write in. Like I said, if you're not a Pelo member, go across and check that out. I'd love to have you on board, whether you're up the front, in the echelon, or back in the doom line. Have you got Life in the Peloton merch? I would love to see you wearing it. Post about it on social. Show me your luft. We've got the international shipping as well. Like I said, next week will be our race communique episode coming to you. So until then, guys... Cheers. That iconic music in this episode was composed by none other than the legend, Pete Shelley. Cheers, mate.